Electronic communication, the ability to send a message across vast distances virtually instantaneously, transformed human culture. Some people consider Samuel Finley Brees Morse, an American inventor, to be the father of electronic communication with the invention of the telegraph. And to give just a, a brief example of how powerful that communication can be, some people argue today that the timing of that invention played a critical role in the timing of the American Civil War. The argument is that instantaneous communication, or the fact that speeches given by different people across the country could be sent by telegraph and printed in newspapers the next day, started to break down trust between frac factions and break down the alliances that had prevented disagreements from turning into fractures. The argument isn't that the telegraph caused the Civil War. The argument is that the telegraph broke down the system that had to that point prevented the Civil War. And if that were the case, it would have been profoundly disappointing to Samuel Morris, who considered himself very much opposed to factionalism. He called himself an American who knew neither North nor South nor East nor West, but considered everyone in the United States to be a fellow countryman. Still, you can't say that Samuel F. B. Morse did not recognize the potential of his invention. As he said in one of the very first telegraphs ever sent on May 24th, 1844, what hath God wrought? Electronic communication today, the technological descendants of Morse's telegraph, rule the world more than ever before. And December 23rd represents an important date in the development of that technology. In fact, some people argue that a small demonstration in Bell Laboratories on December 23rd, 1947, is one of the single most important events in human history. And the, the developments that took us to that seminal date deserve to be remembered. Samuel Morse and the Telegraph are a prime example of the powerful effect that invention can have on history. And this is even more clear if you understand his specific role in one of the key advancements of the modern age. Morse was not the first to recognize that an open and closed circuit could be used for communication. He wasn't even the first to build one. There are several inventors who can claim to have invented the Telegraph ahead of Samuel Morse. But Morse, with a couple of collaborators, made two vital contributions that gave him claim to the title as the father of electronic communication. First, with the help of chemistry professor Leonard Gale, he invented the relay. The relay addresses a fundamental problem with electronic communication, that the signal degrades with distance. That limit meant that telegraphs were limited to a fairly short range, not devices that could communicate around the world. The solution that Morris and Gale designed, the relay, works as a repeater. They refresh the signal coming in from one circuit by transmitting it on another. Relays, not much changed, are still used in many settings today. Secondly, working with machinist Alfred Bale, Morse developed Morse code, the ability to use simple open and closed circuits and just two signals, a dot and a dash, to communicate language, thus making the telegraph a practical means of communication. These two developments, the ability to amplify a signal so that it can be heard, and the ability to turn the simplest electronic signal into communication, weren't just keys to making a practical telegraph, they were keys to the development of the modern world. As with the development of telegraphy, the development of wireless telegraphy can be attributed to many inventors, notably Guglielmo Marconi. Marconi developed the first practical operating radio transmitters and receivers in 1894 and was able to make great strides in the effective distance of wireless telegraphy through his understanding of antennas, defined in Marconi's law. But Marconi's radios had significant limits. The receiver was only powered by the power that reached the antenna. Thus, antennas had to be massive, and transmitters had to use huge amounts of power. And still, no matter the antenna, the signal was weak. A Marconi radio required headsets to hear, and the receiver only heard dots and dashes using Morse's code. While wireless telegraphy had important applications, particularly the ability to transmit to ships at sea, wireless telegraphy lacked a critical component. It did not have a version of Morse's relay. To truly change the world, it needed amplification. Like telegraphy, the answer to the problem of amplification can be attributed to many inventors, but the one most commonly attributed with the key invention was Lee de Forest. De Forest's contribution was the invention of the Audion, which was the first triode in 1906. Interestingly, de Forest did not invent the Audion with the idea of amplification. It was built as a radio receiver. The Audion uses a vacuum tube, although de Forest's early Audion still had residual gas in the tube. The Audion included three electrodes, or electrical conductors, a heated filament, a grid, and a plate. 
the gas in the tube would be heated, creating an electrical current that was affected by radio waves. When the tube was subjected to radio waves, those would close a circuit, which could be heard via headphones. While well, DeForest had invented a new form of radio receiver, which he could market without patent disputes, he did not at the time realize its most important potential. The Audion produced gain. Since the headphones could be hooked to a battery, the Audion did not, like other receivers, re rely entirely on the power that reached the antenna from the transmitter. The Audion could use a lower power radio wave to direct a higher power stream of electricity. The signal was amplified. That meant that a signal from a weak transmitter could be heard over a much greater distance. While it took time before researchers really understood the amplifying effect of the Audion tube, its impact was enormous. In brief, the heated filament creates electrons that, through a process called thermionic emission. The electrons move freely through the near vacuum of the tube. And this creates a current between the cathode, which creates the stream of electrons, and the metal plate, the positively charged anode that attracts the electrons. The third electrode is a low power varying signal that acts like a gate across the stream. If it's negatively charged, it repels some electrons. Positively charged, it attracts them. So the low power charge controls the more powerful stream of electrons in exact proportion. This means a small signal could be made much louder. The tubes could amplify both a transmitter and a receiver and meant that radio waves were no longer limited entirely by how much power reached an antenna and could amplify signal beyond dots and dashes. De Forest's invention of the Audion tube initiated the field of electronics, the physics, engineering, technology, and application that deals with the emission, flow, and control of electrons in both vacuums and matter. The eventual applications far exceeded that recognized by De Forest at the time. Triodes could serve as a repeater amplifier for telephones, much like Morse's repeater, but transmitting the full range of voice, making long-distance telephony possible. Previously, telephones were limited in range to about 800 miles. The triode allowed radio to broadcast full sound, not just dots and dashes, and loudly enough that it could be heard without headphones, allowing a radio that a family could sit around and hear. Radio went from a simple message system to a medium of mass communication. After Atlantic Telephone and Telegraph purchased a force patents in 1913, the tubes were developed to create public address systems, sound recording systems, and then synchronized sound systems for motion pictures allowing talkies. These systems massively impacted culture and history. They allowed a truly mass medium that, unlike print, did not require literacy, was freed from physical boundaries of delivery. A person can now receive mass media content while doing other work. Music and entertainment were transformed, and entire genres of music owe their existence to the radio that was allowed by amplifying tubes. People became more involved in news and events of the day, developed more meaningful relationships with their political leaders whose voices and faces now became familiar. In many ways, the most powerful leaders of the 20th century, people like Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and of course Adolf Hitler, were creatures of the era of electronic amplification. But applications for these amplifying tubes went beyond communication. The first computers, machines that can be instructed to carry out sequences of arithmetic or logical operations, were mechanical. These computers used disks, gears, or pulleys, and the calculations were derived from the mechanical process. Such computers go back to antiquity, for example the abacus, a calculating device that may date back more than 4,000 years. Mechanical computers capable of more complex mathematical calculations that could be programmed, for example, English mathematician Charles Babbage's Difference Engine, were developed in the 19th century. Mechanical computers were enhanced by early electronics, using electrical relays to turn the mechanical levers, increase speed, and decrease size, creating marvels, like the U.S. Navy's Torpedo Data Computer, used on Second World War submarines, and which could do advanced trigonometrical calculations needed to determine torpedo firing solutions. In fact, what many consider to be the first modern computer, the Z3, built by German inventor Konrad Zuse in 1941, was electromechanical. Zuse's machine used telephone relays and was the first to define a code based on a switch being turned off and on, rather than purely mechanical aspects like gear sizes, thus making it a digital as opposed to the earlier analog computers. Thus, Samuel Morse's relay became the basis for the language used to program virtually all digital computers. Binary. The use of just two signals, just like the telegraph's dot and dash, to create an infinitely complex message. If you understand how the telephone relays worked in Zusa Z3, and how the Audion tube by DeForest worked, then you see the potential.
A triode essentially is a device where one electrode sends a message to two other electrodes, which allows you to send a binary message without the need for the mechanical switch, electronically, at the speed of light. The first computer which used vacuum tubes for the logic circuitry was invented at Iowa State University in 1939, but it had limited purpose and was built not to be programmable, but to solve a set of linear equations. Another early example of so-called first generation or vacuum tube computers was the Colossus machines, built between 1943 and 1945 and used by British intelligence to do the mathematical calculations that allowed code breakers to parse through the huge number of potential settings on a German Enigma code machine. There were eventually 10 Colossus machines, with the earliest using some 1,500 vacuum tubes. Machines, and their essential role in breaking the German code, materially affected the outcome of the Second World War. Further developments included the U.S.-built Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, or ENIAC, capable of solving a large class of numerical programs through programming. Completed in 1945, ENIAC used some 20,000 vacuum tubes, was a thousand times faster than electromechanical computers. But vacuum tubes are, of course, relatively large and fragile. Tubes take time to warm up and require large amounts of electrical energy and thus produce large amounts of heat. Despite being marbles of their age, they require large rooms to be able to do what, by today's standards, were very few calculations. Which is how we get to the importance of December 23rd. In 1923, Polish-American inventor Julius Lillenfeld patented a method and apparatus for controlling electric current. The idea was a solid-state device that used an electric field to control the flow of current using semiconductive materials. Semiconductive materials are materials whose electrical conductivity sits in between a conductor and an insulator. For such materials, their resistance falls as their temperature rises. Since the electrical properties of these materials can be affected by electrical fields, they could work both as an amplifier and as a switch, much like DeForest's Audion tubes. But they would be smaller, less fragile, and require smaller amounts of energy. Despite the promise of his idea, the quality and purity of the available semiconductors at the time was insufficient for Lillenfeld to produce a working version, and the patent went largely unnoticed. Following the Second World War, Bell Labs in Manhattan formed a group dedicated to finding a solid-state alternative to the vacuum tube. Like Lillenfield, they had trouble producing a working version until they came upon the idea of working with the semiconductor's surface state rather than an external electrical field. In 1947, the team of physicists John Bardeen, Walter Bratton, and William Shockley managed to create a working device that used two foil leads to disrupt the surface state across the semiconductor germanium. A small charge in one gold lead would change the resistance of the germanium, changing the electron flow. In fact, the charge in the second contact was larger than the change in the first. Thus, the device operated as an amplifier. Another team member, John Robinson Pierce, created a name for the new device. As vacuum tubes relied on transconductance, the new device worked by transresistance. A device that used transresistance was thus called a transistor. They first demonstrated the working device to colleagues on December 23rd, 1947, and that date has become enshrined as the birthday of the transistor. The magazine Computer World described the importance of this date. The transistor, they argued in 2007, is the most important invention of the 20th century. Civil engineer Trevor English was more direct, calling the transistor the world's most important thing. For their discovery, Shockley, Bardeen, and Bratton were awarded the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. It's not just the nature of transistors, amplifiers that make things like radios, televisions, and cell phones small enough to hold, and switches that allow far more processes in far less space with far less energy than the vacuum tubes that preceded them. It is also how quickly the technology has been able to advance. After several developments, Bell Labs engineers Mahama Atla and Dewan Kong developed the Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor, otherwise known as the MOS or MOSFET. The device was the first truly scalable transistor. It could be easily manufactured, placed in an integrated circuit, essentially many tiny transistors stamped onto a single sheet of semiconductive material. The MOSFET is included in virtually all modern electronics. Billions are manufactured every day. 
an estimated 13 sextillion were manufactured between 1960 and 2018. It is the single most frequently manufactured device in human history. The evolution of transistor technology has been astounding. In 1965, Gordon Moore, a founder of Intel, noted that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit doubled every year since their invention. He predicted the trend would continue, and it has to this day. The astounding trend is now called Moore's Law. How do you encapsulate the importance of a technology that has transformed nearly every field of human industry? How do you account for the lives saved by the medical advances that it's allowed, the lives enriched by the increased availability and reliability of transportation that it caused, the, the impact on science and technology of the huge ability to aggregate and access information, the virtual shrinking of the world through electronic communication? How do you quantify the importance of a technology that allowed us to go to the moon with a guidance computer that had only some 32,000 bits of RAM, one millionth of what is on a modern cell phone. How can you express the importance of a technology that takes the computational power of the Colossus that helped to win the Second World War and places it on the point, not the head, the point of a pin? And like Morse's telegraph, will all that bring us together? Or we're tear us apart. How do you talk about the importance of the technology whose anniversary we celebrate on December 23rd? I don't have the words for it. I can only echo those of Samuel Morse. What hath God wrought? I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.